Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today is uh, January 17th, business session. Uh, is there approval of the minutes? From the approved. Sorry. It's been moved in a second. All in favor of the minutes being approved, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. January 10th's minutes have been approved. Pet licensing enforcement update. Welcome. And Councilman Sharp, you want to... Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, we had a very good and very positive presentation the other day before the Public Safety and Emergency Services Committee on the progress uh, we are making on licensing our pets and on an exciting new partnership uh, that is being launched to uh, uh, help that even further. So uh, we thought it was something that really the full council uh, should be aware of and appreciate having it on the agenda. And I'd like to turn it over to Deletta Dean and let them take it from there. Great. Deletta, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Good afternoon, everyone. With me, I have um, Michelle Rivera, uh, Executive Director of Spay Neuter Kansas City, and also Patrick Everywhere, Division Manager for Animal Health and Public Safety. Uh, as Councilman Sharp said, um, this afternoon we will provide you with an update uh, since we uh, last made some changes to the ordinance back in January. So it's been almost a year now. So we wanted to provide an update with the progress that we've made and also about the new exciting partnership that we have with SNKC. So we'll start out with a presentation and then we'll show the PSA and then Michelle will speak about Project TLC. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Patrick have you are manager of uh, animal health public safety on the uh, <clears throat> excuse me on the very first slide uh, back in October of uh, 2011 the uh, the department uh, neighborhood housing services uh, department we convened a task force to uh, identify barriers to pet licenses and develop uh, strategies to increase uh, license compliance uh, based on that task force, which I believe Michelle was gracious enough to chair, uh, we made a recommendation to the council, and uh, in January, the council approved uh, an ordinance and uh, made some changes to the existing ordinance. As a part of the, uh, the changes that were made, <coughs> all one-year licenses uh, were reduced to $10, altered or not altered. In the past, it used to be if the, last, if the animal was not altered, it was $33. If it was altered, it was $10. So we removed that particular provision. So if it's altered or not, just $10. And the, uh, the three-year licenses, pretty much the same. The same. It used to be uh, if it was altered, 27 Unaltered, it was $99. So once again, it removed that provision from altered or not altered. So all three-year licenses are $27. Uh, they also recommended the, uh, the free ride home program. And if the animal is uh, found and it's got a license on it, we would the animal control officers would take the animal home to the owner. But that is actually done one, once per year. So we keep track of those that, that uh, we've returned to, to the owners so we don't have to do it twice. And also, the, uh, <coughs> if, if the animal was found and no one was home, Okay, what we do is there will be no impound fee, and uh, if it stays at the shelter, the shelter was required to give a half price for returning the animal home. And also, uh, throughout uh, May, till May of, May of last year, we have an uh, amnesty program, so the $25 fee was waived until May of last year. I believe a lot of people took advantage of that uh, amnesty program. Then all the funds, just uh, it's worth mentioning, though, all the funds... Uh, we get from our pet licenses, go to the support and improvement of the uh, in the animal shelter. Since uh, the ordinance was changed, we basically uh, have so many uh, uh, marketing effort that we've done. Uh, we've uh, released uh, so many press releases have been issued. Uh, lost pet signage placed on all animal control vehicles, the trucks, uh, all the vehicles that we have. I think about 20 or 30 of them. You see the posters on them. Hey, and the uh, we placed the uh, lost pet posters and signs in the offices of all the participating vets. Right now, we have uh, 
uh, about a total of 33. I, I passed out the information to everyone. Since uh, last week, when we did a presentation at the at the uh, Public Safety Committee, we've been lucky enough to add uh, four more uh, names to the list. Those are highlighted in red. And also, the uh, uh, in PetSmart, there's Animal Hospital in PetSmart called <coughs> Benfield, and they agreed to uh, start selling licenses beginning February of next year, of this year, February 1st. So that's good news for us. And also, the uh, we also have the posters in some of the city supporting community resource centers. And additionally, we have uh, a Lost Pest uh, billboard on all the tail lights, about 10 of them, the metro buses. We have a picture showing one of the, uh, the metro bus. I've never seen those. Yeah, that was, uh, that was ran uh, last year, from, I believe, from uh, April to December of last year. Is that your dog? Yeah. Is that your dog? No, that's not me. Okay. Of <laughs> no, it's not good. And, you know, continuing with the uh, the marketing efforts, we also have uh, Lost Pets uh, bu uh, billboard placed in the rotation on Turn One, uh, uh, Channel Two, and all local uh, veterinarians have sent invitations, invitation letters to participate. We've been making follow-up phone calls to them. As you can tell, those phone calls are pretty much uh, yielding results, and. Uh, Early of last year, you know, the city hall entrances, we had those posters. I don't know if anybody saw those posters. They were there early last year. And we also have uh, quarterly city published uh, neighborhood newsletters, e-newsletters that contain licensing article and lost past uh, poster. You know, the newsletter reaches over 200 neighborhoods. Because of the, uh, the size of the, uh, 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 the list, we decided to make copies for everyone. It's kind of hard to see it. That's what we have up there. Okay. Uh, three ways you can license your pet. Pretty much put up there, you can come down to the city's animal shelter, 4400 Raytown Road. Uh, you can contact your veterinarian who may be able to sell licenses. And or visit uh, Pet Data online at uh, www.petdata.com. Or if you, if you check the, uh, the division's uh, web page at uh, kcmo.org slash animal, we have a web page that have all the information in it. It also has a link to the list that, that we will have for uh, vets that sell licenses. And on the, uh, I should have made copies of this, it's kind of little to see. It's basically a breakdown on how much uh, sales we make per month, uh, broken down into one-year licenses, three-year licenses, and uh, replacement tags. This was a period since uh, the ordinance was changed back uh, uh, January of 20, 2012. This information contained all the uh, sales from uh, January to December. And uh, just in case somebody is wondering, if we have more sales from last year compared to the previous year, we actually sold uh, 181 licenses more compared to the previous year, just in case. Okay. We also put in there some of the impediments to increase licensure. You know, we cannot, the, the state vets or whatever vet we, uh, uh, any local vet, they can share information with us as far as if any animal is licensed, if any animal has uh, uh, rabies vaccination, but it, when it, in, in terms of asking them to give us a list so we can double check and see who uh, all the animals with vaccinations, if they have license on it, they, will, they, they won't give us that information. So that's one of the impediments we have. Um, another one has to do with the, uh, I think about three or four years ago, we had the door-to-door uh, -door, uh, pet enumeration program. That was not well received by citizens. You know, officers were going from door to door writing tickets. He said, let me see if your pet has license. And they didn't appreciate that at all. I think it was a big problem. So we had to pull back on that. So unless uh, if everybody feels it's okay, we can, we can bring that, bring by that program. And uh, I put in there the uh, National Benchmark for Pet Licenses. You know, as information we obtained from our vendor, if you look at that, the... Uh, Average compliance rate for, for the nation is about 16.10%, and we are pretty much there, 16.10% for dogs. As far as cats are concerned, 
The, uh, the national benchmark is 2.80%, and we are slightly under, which is 2.5%. Uh, okay. Additional efforts to increase the uh, pet licensing. Uh, what we have right now is pretty much uh, the uh, TLC program, which Michelle Rivera is going to talk about. But what we do intend to do also during the summertime, we have, we're just brainstorming in the office. We're going to be going in front of the uh, pet smart offices and recruit volunteers to pass out information, flyers, to, to encourage people to get more licenses too. So I will, uh, that concludes my presentation. If there's any more questions, I'll be glad to answer any questions. So we'll pass it on to Michelle. We'll uh, proceed with showing the PSA, and then we'll have Michelle speak, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. Oh, it worked. Right away. Oh. Hi, I'm Michelle with Spay and Neuter, Kansas City. Thank you for letting us come and present our, our program. And for those of you that aren't familiar with our organization, I left everybody a little packet that gives a little profile on our organization and what we do for the Kansas City community. One of our primary goals, obviously, is to spay and neuter more animals and decrease uh, the surplus of pets in our community. Um, in addition, our programs also um, promote responsible pet ownership um, in the hopes of decreasing shelter intake and keeping animals in their homes. Um, what we found in the past, despite even you know providing over 8,000 rabies vaccinations to Kansas City, Missouri pet owners, um, licensing over 1,000 pets, there's still too many animals entering our shelters that don't have their tags on, and it, it's simple as that. They're buying their tags, some of them, um, and they're not putting them on their animals, so microchipping is an important part of that as a permanent identification piece. So we've created the, the Project TLC, which is Tag, License, and Chip. Um, it's a package of $30, which is the lowest price in the greater Kansas City area to get all of those three things. Um, our hopes are, um, you know, in increasing that compliance to reunite more animals with their owners in the hopes that mo many will be able to be taken home before even going to the shelter or that those are entering the shelter can be reunited with their pet owners and, and decrease the shelter intake. Um, we've got some really um, exciting statistics to present to you. My staff has some numbers already. We launched this January 2nd, and we're seeing it. It's a huge hit. We're already seeing very good results. Hello, I'm Whitney Mathis. I'm the operations manager at Spay and Neuter. And so far since the second, we've sold 69 TLC packages. That's less than three weeks. Um, 27 have been added to surgery clients. 42 have come to our walk-in clinic. Um, and 20 of those have been pit bull or pit bull mixed dogs that have made sure that they're in compliance with the Kansas City laws. I'm Christy Taylor. I'm the surgery call center manager. Uh, microchips in, uh, in January of 2012, from January 1st to the 30th, were 66 last year. Since launching our new TLC program January 1st this year, microchips January 1st to today, January 17th, 
177. Wow. That's up more than 150%. Right. City licensing sales January of 2012, last year, 107. City license sales January to today, the 17th, 113. Estimated to double licensing sales from last year at our clinic this year, so. Um, so, you know, pet owners are able to come into our clinic and get those done at our walk-in wellness clinic at the time of surgery. And as Patrick mentioned, we hope to host a couple of satellite clinics this year, um, get them sponsored where we can provide this package to pet owners in certain zip codes for absolutely free. If we can get these clinics sponsored. Um, our hopes would be to see about 500 pets turn out for each clinic um, and really see a dramatic increase in, in the animals reunited with their pet owners. Great. And I'd also like to add that um, animal health and public safety, the animal control staff are also passing out that information. Uh, they all have the flyers, and actually I believe Brooke is here, who was the, co the animal uh, uh, <coughs> officer, animal control officer that you actually saw walking down the alley to, to pick up uh, the, the bandit. Um, so um, uh, I'm, I'm excited about the partnership and the opportunity, and as um, both Michelle and Patrick said, we are looking to host two additional uh, clinics in hopes to really work and reach that 10,000 uh, pet license goal <coughs> this year. So we're going to be really aggressive about it. To let us some, some things that come to mind from we all have ways we reach out to our constituents, our Facebooks and our email listing and even web pages. Um, any of that presentation, um, the commercial, the list of um, got contacts where you can get services, if we could get that to um, sent in PDFs or however is best, that then we can put it up on on our way that we communicate. Sure. Um, that would be That'd great. Be great. Appreciate it. Do you have any that. questions, Melba, Councilman Curl? What, what percentage, or do you know, of citizens have their animals vaccinated? It seems like, you know, it went up from one year to the next, but it still didn't seem like a lot. I see, I walk my dog, Herbie. I see pets everywhere. I see, who are you and where did you come from? So I'm wondering, are they, do they have their shots and do we have do we have any idea of how many more we need to reach? Um, I, in your booklet that I handed out, there's some statistics on estimated how many animals are in the Kansas City area. That's broken down by dogs and cats. It's hard to tell actually how many are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing nearly 14,000 pets come through our clinic every year. That includes spay neutering vaccinations. Um, these are these new pets. Um, yeah, or we're coming back. Oh, for, some of them come, yeah. come back. And there's okay. even a breakdown in there in your booklet um, per zip code, how many animals that we're serving out of those zip codes per city and everything like that. It's really hard to tell. I, I think it's what's key is that um, maybe many of these are being vaccinated, but they're not putting their tags on them. They're just yeah, simply not putting it. their tag. Yeah. I mean, it's hard sometimes to take those out of the wrapper, mm -hmm. take the little ring, and people just aren't doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to add to that. One thing that we do know, about 9% of the animals, dogs and cats in Kansas City have current licenses on them. Mm -hmm. Like Michelle said, we don't have the information on the vaccination per se. But you, like but I was saying I earlier, know. we cannot get that information collectively from all the vets. About 9% of all the pets in Kansas City we know have uh, current licenses on them. You're saying 9%? Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, just briefly, my, uh, one time my dog Herbie was missing. And uh, he didn't have, the, he has a microchip now. At the time, he didn't. But the the, do, uh, the um, facility on Raytown Road wasn't open on Mondays, which I didn't know. So I was calling Monday, and I did get the recording. But when I went, to, they called me back Tuesday and said, we have your dog. He, he was dragging his leash, and they figured he belonged to somebody. And so, but, I, but I didn't know, is, is your facility open spay and neuter? Are they open Monday through, or are they not open on Mondays? We're open Monday through Saturday. Are you? Okay. Mm -hmm. The shelter's now open. The shelter's yeah. now open as well. Mondays. Is it? Okay. Yeah, they just started that. Yeah, they changed okay. their hours with the season. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for all that you do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councilman Ford. Uh, let's go through the numbers again. Uh, so how many pets do we currently have licensed? 9%. Did, did no what's, the, what's that number? Well, the number we get is about 23,000, between 23,000 and 23,500. Is, is our estimate 
Yes, those are the actual numbers we have of pets that have current licenses. You know, surprise the ones that were previously licensed, dropped off, but they just currently have license. And when we use that to get a percentage of the guest estimate of how many pets we have in Kansas City, using the AVMA pet calculator, that you get 9% of that total number has current licenses. You want me to say that again? So wh how many pets do we believe we dogs, cats, are, are in Kansas City? Based on the number we have, AVMA, she may have a different number, about 116,000 uh, <coughs> dogs and uh, 136,000 cats. So it breaks down to about 247,000 and some numbers. So if we get in about 23, 5 that I actually have, that actually have uh, licenses per month, you do the percentage, that come out to be 9%. Okay. So I'm, so we're talking about 91% are, are not licensed. Correct. Okay. These are the numbers. So there's a, and in terms of historic numbers, uh, the most uh, pets we've ever had licensed in a year? I have to get the, uh, look at the data. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious. <laughs> I, I can recall many years ago. Sure. Yeah. A knock on my door, and of course my dog went nuts, and it was animal control oh, asking right. me if I had a dog. <laughs> that was me barking. I recall, I recall. I think it was four years ago we did the enumeration. We actually increased our license sales, so that's one of the effective tools. But what, we have. one of the things they did then is they basically gave you then thirty days or three weeks or something to get the get license. The license. Okay, so you weren't an, uh, immediately ticketed, but they certainly had the incentive to, yeah. to get it. So if we do go back to door to door, I thought that was a pretty good approach. Yeah, when we uh, when we did the door to door uh, four years ago, what we did was we picked three different uh, neighborhood areas in each district, so we don't say nobody's picking on a particular district, and we notified the neighborhood association president two weeks before we actually came out and did the tickets. So and have have we? Uh, try to market this through the water bill? Well, we've always, people have always argued that's not an effective way to, to, to market it because people don't actually look at it, they throw them away. So unless uh, we could certainly try. I mean, that gets to every household in the city. It, it does, but we found, honestly, the education, the door-to-door, -door, the face-to-face -face, um, is the best way to market and, and get people to comply. The statistics that I have in here for how many estimated dogs and cats in Kansas City are for our targeted zip codes. And when I mean targeted, we're focused on a certain amount of zip codes in the Kansas City area that make up about 80% of all animal control calls. We go door-to-door -door through our outreach program. That's how we get a lot of our spays and neuters right there face-to-face -to, -face to be able to talk to them, giving them a piece of paper and asking them to comply doesn't always happen. We don't, we don't get, see a lot of compliance on that. And even if they do call to want to get their animal fixed, they don't show up. So we have a transport program. So we're out in the community going door to door in these targeted zip codes and, and with this project TLC that's going to be a part of our education program, not only just spay neutering, but to take license and ship. Honestly, we haven't marketed it in the past heavily because spay neutering <coughs> was our, our primary objective. But our goal is also to decrease the number of animals entering our shelter. So we're really um, going to be aggressively marketing and educating our community on this. It seems, uh, uh, I know our, our animal control and our shelters are underfunded, that, but there seems to be 91% uh, that if we could just double the number we have now, that would certainly go a long way mm -hmm. into addressing. So I don't know if, if thinking outside the box, if, if we can talk to people who run license offices, and see if, if they would sell tags when you go and renew your driver's license. You might go ahead and, and license your your dog, public libraries, you know, places where you register to vote. I mean, it, it seems there's, and, and, and we can make their incentive where they get to keep 10% or whatever of what they. I think what, one of the biggest objectives there is you're talking about, I think, a large percentage of pet owners who are low income in our targeted areas. and. It, Yes, they may be able to pick up a form to license their pet, but they're going to have to get the rabies vaccination first to get the, to purchase the city license. They'll have to show proof of that rabies vaccination. So they need to get themselves to a vet and get their dog uh, rabies vaccinated as well. So do we believe there's like 90% of our dogs and, and uh, that uh, do not have a current rabies? 
I no, I don't think so. you know. We've vaccinated eight, almost eight thousand four hundred pets for rabies vaccinations last year. Not all Kansas City, Missouri. I don't have the percentage of what that is, but that's because it's part of a package deal with our spay and neuter. We weren't heavily pushing the city license as well. It's kind of an option. Now we're kind of enforcing and, and encouraging them to get that at the same time. Okay. And Councilman Ford, not um, as we talked about in, in a public safety committee last week, uh, our role uh, is to really recruit additional veterinarians, especially those within the heart of the city that don't currently sell license. Um, so, um, Pet owners may very well have those animals vaccinated, but if their vet doesn't sell the license, then they're not purchasing them from the vet. So we're really going to aggressively, and that's how we were able to even get four within a week, and that staff is continually contacting those vets to encourage them to sign up. And then also to sponsor the uh, vaccination clinics. We had one last year at the National Night Out event, and we vaccinated 150 animals. Uh, in a couple of hours. So to Michelle's point about individuals uh, looking for um, you know, that vaccination at an affordable rate, we offered it, we partnered with SNKC and, <coughs> and provided that vaccination for free, provided that they purchased a license. So we really want to do uh, more uh, clinics in hopes that we would attract, it's, it's going to take time for sure, but uh, be able to offer those clinics at least and give individuals an opportunity to get the vaccination and the license at an affordable rate. But it sounds like a, a large portion of our dog and cat population are probably not vaccinated. Like a, Which would in our targeted zip codes. In our zip lower. codes, yeah. Okay. In the, yeah so. I think it's 64130 is where we have the uh, largest amount of stray animals that we pick up, So, which is where we had the vaccination clinic last year. So, yeah. We've, we've also reached out to a Walmart and CVS, high vs You know, we've been turned down. Mm. You know, so we are reaching out to whoever we can possibly reach out to. Okay. And I, I just want to add one, <clears throat> one more statistic on there that, we, that we've that uh, we been keeping track of. We keep track of um, the, the pet owners that are coming through, um, how they heard about us, and how they acquired their pet. We found out that 85% of the pet owners that are coming through us uh, uh, acquire their pets as strays or unwanted animals in their neighborhoods. They're taking these animals in. And I think what's happening is there's a disconnect between being fully responsible for that animal. They took it in, put it in their backyard, they're feeding it. But if it, if it goes missing, are they going to go down to the shelter and get it? Probably not. They were just trying to do that animal service and, and help take it in. So that's part of our education. Again, you know, thank you for taking this animal and you're helping us. You're helping this animal. Now, will you keep it, you know, get it spayed and neutered, vaccinated? They can put a little bit of money into that. They have a little bit more value on that animal, and they're more inclined to keep that animal. Thank you. Um, before I go on, I... Uh, couple of thoughts. We, um, Councilman Brooks and I, had our quarterly leadership uh, meeting this past Saturday, 50 people or so, and we did talk about it there. So that's another opportunity um, with councils meeting with their neighborhood leaders to get that information out. And I'm, I'm, you're, you mentioned that a lot of times they're licensed, but they don't even have their tags on. My dog happens to be chipped because same thing, I lost her, and so then I got her chipped after I lost her and got her back. But one of the reasons she doesn't wear her her tags is because they jingle all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe if we can have a conversation with whoever makes these to figure out a way to make them be quiet. Quiet. <laughs> yeah. To be well, and especially then if you have two tags, if you mm -hmm. have the 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 rabies tag and then the the information tag. Um, so, you know, it sounds whiny, I know, but we're constantly taking it off at night, and then you forget to put it on in the morning and, and those types of things. I'm sure I'm not, I know I'm not the only person <laughs> that, has, that has that problem. So, uh, Councilman Reed. Uh, thank you. Um, my, my, my question is kind of along the lines of what um, Councilman Ford was asking about, and I asked this last week in our public safety uh, committee, is because, uh, well, actually it looks as if you all added uh, several uh, new locations on the list that was handed out to us and so now it makes 33 uh, places to where people can get their licensing um, but out of the the new ads which are four of them um, I mean we still don't have any places out of this list of 33 in the urban core uh, central city and when you start talking about low-income uh, residents many of these areas 
uh, are people who are low income, live right in the heart of the central city, and don't have access uh, to a car, perhaps, and they're not able to go. Yeah, they, they can't get on the bus, uh, use tr public uh, transportation, um, unless it is a service um, animal or something along those lines. Uh, and so it, it creates a concern, uh, especially when trying to dig down and look at the numbers in terms of saying um, how many animals are, you know, have the shots or how many animals actually do have licenses. And there's no, especially when I look at some of these zip codes um, in the targeted area, uh, 641 uh, 10, 641 30, 641 27, 641 33. Uh, I mean, those are areas that, you know, are mainly in the heart of the city and no places for people to go. Could you talk a little bit more about the additional efforts outside of the National Night Out Against Crime for? Um, for people to actually get their licensing and what you all are, are doing to um, not only try to recruit more vets, but get people to get their dogs licensed. If I may, um, I have a list of all the uh, the vets within the uh, city, inner city pretty much. Uh, we, we contacted Union Hill on uh, 3025 Main. They said no. You know, we've this is not the first, second, or third time we've tried them. As a matter of fact, those people on the list, we've contacted them before. It's just persistency made them sign up. We, uh, Prospect Animal Hospital on 58th and Prospect, they said no. Uh, the uh, Eastwood Animal Hospital, not far from the shelter, they said no. And uh, uh, Stock Pharmacy on uh, 6675 Homes, they said no. The uh, 4314 Main Street, right now they said no, but we'll, we'll keep calling them. 4400 Broadway, medical pharmacy, they, they told us no. Uh, March Sunfresh uh, Pharmacy on uh, 4001 Mill Street, uh, they, they want us to call back, we'll call them back. In um, Price Chopper, we contacted the corporate office, uh, Spolitos on Independence Avenue, we've contacted them, you know, and said call back, it's so busy, we're calling him back. Well, can, can I ask, because you, you've given probably, it looks like eight no's and perhaps one or two callbacks that you've listed in your example. What, what, are, what, are, what do you think are some of the reasons for them to say no? Do we have provide incentives? Or, uh, what, yeah. what are the, I mean, those, that's eight or nine people you already went through a list and said no. Yeah, you know, one of the problem we they, they don't want to they don't feel is uh, it's worth the effort in terms of uh, two dollar charge for 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 providing licenses, and uh, they feel it's too much paperwork. You know they don't want to they don't think it's uh, like I said it's not cost effective. It's not worth the effort for them. Which some of them said they may have to hire additional staff to, to do all the paperwork for two dollar additional fee. Yeah, that's one of the biggest uh, problems we have in terms of those who we call mm -hmm. trying to recruit them to sell licenses. Can we waive the fee? Is that something that Councilwoman Marcuson's committee can do for us? They get the, well, they no, get the, no, they, they get, get the two dollars. Oh, oh, they get the two dollars. Correct. Okay. Yeah, they get the for two dollars for every license they sell. So that's yeah. profit for them. Profit they for still them. are saying no. Yeah, and, you know they have to. The record keeping, all that stuff, money collection, sending it to pet data. So to them, it's, it's not worth the effort. And if I can add on to that, we starting Mar in March, we are planning on smaller satellite clinics. We already have one scheduled at uh, the West Can Center. We work with them annually. Um, Don Bosco, a couple of the libraries in town, so that we're hopefully able to fill into those gaps and go out and offer the, the Project TLC package. Um, in those communities, what we need help with maybe from you guys is is the neighborhood associations or the contact people to get a hold of to help us get that information out way ahead of time so that the pet owners know in that area that we're coming to that area to provide those services. Yeah. Well, you're well, working I, with the best department to get you connected with the neighborhood leaders. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say because we just had our third district meeting this past Monday and this was information that we gave out. Uh, as well to the neighborhood leaders as well. So I, I do understand it's a challenge, but uh, just wanting to make sure that it's out there uh, and that uh, we are doing things to address it. The last thing I wanted to um, sort of probably give a plug for was the video, which is pretty cool. 
Um, uh, is there a local um, um, video company, production company that did the video? It, it's uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, he's a local, he's private. He um, helps a lot of the animal welfare organizations out in town. Um, the dog was uh, a friend of his dog. Um, and uh, he's very well behaved. We took almost everything in one shot. Mm -hmm. There's people hiding behind the trees and fence posts calling him, but no, he was a fa it was amazing. And who is he? Andrew Weist. Is it Weist? Weist. 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 Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Trump, do you want to wrap wrap it up, or do you want to get in front of? The well, can I mention just a couple of things because sure. they've been brought up and it might save some uh, further questions. Uh, in uh, public safety, uh, we w were very impressed with the PSA, and, and uh, I suggested that uh, if Deletta could talk to our city communications to, to get that on the ro rotation for Channel 2. Oh, that would be because, I was uh, making the assumption that was happening. Yeah. Well, I, I think it is. It, it, is. The hard copy it has happened. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, good. Okay. Because, uh, you know, it's certainly uh, more entertaining than some of the things we have on there. Like our sessions. That was good, Ed. On, uh, I'm pleased to see four more veterinarian offices uh, recruited since our, our hearing, and that at least uh, three of them are, are kind of in the central part of the city, and it's good to see the one on Prospect on East 63rd. But we still need to do better in the core of the city. And, and uh, really, I think uh, these companies that think it's not worth their trouble, uh, I think that's pretty short-sighted because that's another reason for people to come to your facility. It's just like uh, uh, hunting and fishing licenses. Almost every major sporting goods store sells hunting and fishing licenses because, again, it's a way to draw people there. And uh, the thought is that if they're there, they'll, they'll probably uh, – purchase some other uh, product or, or service, but uh, I'm very pleased to hear that we're about to get a PetSmart location because uh, they are high volume places and, and not just vets, but the more we can do pet stores and pet supply stores, uh, I think that will help. But I hope we could also make some of our facilities available for this, Mohart Center or some of our other uh, community centers would, would be places that a lot of people go, and we do have a pretty good uh, a geographic distribution of them. A and I do hope uh, uh, the department can, can look again at using the water bill inserts. Uh, we put in water bill inserts about our prescription drug discount card program, uh, and that has gotten a lot of people participating in it. Uh, the fire department, I think, is very close to putting in an, an insert again about the membership program for, for the ambulance service, and there's very little cost. It's just printing a, a two-sided sheet of paper that you can print three of them on an eight-and-a-half by 11 uh, uh, piece of paper, both sides, and uh, a couple of thousand for printing, but nothing on postage, and, and it does get people out. It does get the word out to all the water bill customers in the city. But, but I'm hoping, well, this was mainly on licensing, Another thing that I know we're all interested in is the adoption rates and being able to release as many animals from the shelter alive as we can. And, and I do think before the presentation is over, I'd like to have the department at least mention the fact that they've had some adoption events up at Zona Rosa and uh, are going to try to do more outreach uh, events like that so you don't always have to go to 4400 Raytown Road. And if also we get the address of spay neuter Kansas City where people can come in. Uh, I know where it is, but uh, I think we probably ought to get that on, on TV. Okay. No, there's on the road. Oh, Kansas City Pet Project, uh, as Councilman Sharp says, does have a satellite office uh, in Zona Rosa. Uh, the satellite office was set up right before, uh, right before Thanksgiving, I believe. Uh, Patrick and I actually went up and visited uh, the site. I never, I was curious. Actually, I'd never seen a, a animal shelter in a upscale um, uh, strip mall, if you will, or shopping area, shopping district. And it was quite impressive. Uh, we walked in, uh, very inviting. Uh, you can see the little puppies at, in the window, and it's right across from Macy's. 
so as you come out, you know, you'll see, see the animals. So uh, we were very, very excited uh, about that opportunity. We learned last week that Pet Project, uh, initially we were under the assumption that it would be a temporary lease, um, but our understanding is that it was met with such success that they want to extend the lease there and make that a permanent location. Uh, and I'm hoping that Patrick has the address. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I don't. I'm sorry. Okay, we will get that address. But it again, it's right uh, immediately across from Macy's. Uh, can't miss it. And it's uh, a signage is there. You'll see also the individuals, the staff there that walk the animals have their brightly colored shirts on. So you'll see them as you're there shopping. They're walking through the district with their with the animals. The one And again, they're taking animals there that are highly adoptable, highly socialized. So they're walking them through the district so that individuals to pique that interest. And uh, when we were there, again, there were people really excited about the opportunity there. And once you get in there, and you understand that these uh, are animals that uh, are up for adoption, they're coming from a city shelter, then that really gets people even more interested. And on the TLC program, can they come to spay and neuter there at 59th and Truce to uh, participate in that? Or, the Project or, TLC? Yeah. Yes. yeah, it's exclusively done at our clinic right now, and then we'll have the satellite clinics throughout the city. Okay, and the address of that? 5900, well, it's uh, 1116 East 59th, Northeast Corner, 59th and Troost. And I believe the other address is 7351 Northwest 87th Terrace. Ma'am, thank you much. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tems. <laughs> <laughs> Technology thank for you. Thank you for saving us. <laughs> I have good stuff, too. Absolutely. <laughs> Councilman Markison. Thank you. Well, first I want to commend the animal uh, control and manual uh, management people in Kansas City and, and our partners for doing such a, such a good job because things have really, I think we have a very, very positive uh, reputation now. I think it's, um, we have a lot of good um, partnerships, a lot of outreach into the community. But from a purely financial standpoint, I'm pretty disappointed. <laughs> I mean, $18,000, I mean, we spent a lot of resources and a lot of effort <laughs> to get more veterinarians and to get more people licensing our animals. And if we've only realized $18,000, I mean, that... that that's that, numbers. That's I think it's 180000 Jan. It's 10 bucks a, a license. We've had $180,000? How, no, how much, how much, how much uh, have we, what revenue have we realized from the sale? The last check, uh, I think it was about... Two hundred sixty-four thousand. The last time oh, okay. I checked. Well, I, I, yeah. Sorry, I. T that's <laughs> much better. I think. We <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. Oh my goodness, because I, I was thinking that in the ordinance we were asked. We uh, was part of that was that you would come to the finance committee quarterly and and um, report on the revenue. We have sent. We, uh, we've fallen down on that, and I, that's you know our fault. Or quarterly right. reports. Um, we we typically email them out um, to the committee. Uh, I believe, actually, I don't remember when the next quarter to do. Okay, I'll, f I'll follow that but more, yeah, I more know closely. We had been emailing them quarterly just to give an update on the revenue collection. Mm -hmm. Good, but again, I, I, so that's a much better revenue figure, but the fact that we're still stuck, you know, at that 10% or, you know, uh, licensing fee. I mean, maybe, maybe I, don't, I don't know if it's if that's the right thing to be doing. And it just seems like with our um, new innovation officer and the new push to technology, it seems like owners could go online, fill out all the paperwork to register their pets and take a piece of paper to the veterinarian and they could hand them a tag. I mean, why, would, why, is, why, do, why does it require the veterinarian to do a lot of data entry or paperwork? Or why, why can't we push that back on the owner? I mean, it seems like our owners need to be more responsible. I'm frustrated by the fact that people can't afford ten dollars for a licensing. How can they afford to have an animal? They're, I know they're expensive. Well, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. If 85 percent of some of these urban core people are taking pets and off the street, we have to look at it as a good thing. They're they're not going into the shelter. They're trying to do the right thing. But if they're not being vaccinated, I mean, that's a health. That's our job that we're problem. going into this communities, educating, promoting responsible pet ownership. 
Um, we have great compliance. Uh, mm -hmm. Example, a few months ago, we went into the Northeast area. We knocked on 945 doors in four hours. We had 120-some pets signed up for spay and neuter. Um, we're very, very well received in the, mm -hmm. com in the community. It's just growing our program and reaching out uh, more to these pet owners. But you get to the problem, well, I just took it in. It's a stray. I was just trying to do the right thing and feed it. They don't sometimes have the money to feed it or to properly care for it. But we look at it as that animal's not in the shelter, and let's teach them to mm -hmm. take care of it and keep it for the remainder of their life. The last thing that we ever want to do is to invest our hard-earned money, our donations, into an animal and a family that gets spayed and neutered, and they turn around and they let it go two months later. Our goal is to keep those animals in their home, improve their quality of life, and teach those pet owners long-term impacts in our community to better take care of the animals. And I think yeah, we're seeing it. No, I appreciate that, and, I, and I, I know that's an important part. Is there an easier way to streamline the registration? I mean, have, have we it's really? So easy. Have we really, Councilwoman? It's actually in? available online. Uh, we sure. were talking about the veterinarians and the urban core primarily because of uh, digital divide. Um, so, you know, with just taking into consideration that you know everyone may not have access to do that online, but you can do it online. And they yeah, will we're mail still in that area that we you. have to use every piece of communication, right? Because the generations haven't merged to one thing yet. And I would think that if you, um, if there were, I mean, many of us have dogs. If we could make sure our own veterinarian, um, or you know, if I, when I go to the Sunfresh, which I go to about on the list. three times a week, you know, and I could find out what what the problem, you know, why it, would they consider, uh, you know. Doing the vet, I mean, I would be glad to ask that question. They certainly know me there, um, and and many others. I think we could maybe be good advocates to increase the number as well. So if there are particular areas that you want to hit, that maybe you could reach out to the council members from that district. Um, we probably know the vet or the grocery store owner or you know whatever store you're trying to reach, and just we can ask the question. Maybe coming from us. You know, they could be more honest, and we could then find out what the barriers are. Because I mean, certainly every grocery store has harvesters coupons that they that they do, and they are not opposed to doing, you know, other things other than selling groceries. So, I'd like to know a little bit more from them about what the why they might be reluctant. I have no idea, because it seems like a good community service. But thank you for working. Thanks to Lena, Councilman Brooks. Yeah, two things. I think I asked this during our committee meeting as well. Is there some stipulations as to who can actually uh, volunteer to provide the licenses if you're having problems with uh, veterinaries? I'm, and, again, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but you got churches that possibly could do it. Uh, my staff might be watching Channel 2, so <laughs> you can just list Zion Grove from now on, and people can take their... They can go to Zion Grove and get their pet licensed. Uh, I'll just put us out on a, on a limb. <laughs> I'll take care of the heat afterwards. Okay. Um, you have a and, computer? Yeah, I'm, and, and and they can go to PetData.com. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm computer literate, too. And right here, you can get online, and you can license your pet, pet in less than five minutes, according to this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that will be helpful as well. you got a number of churches, and again, uh, 64130 sounds to be, seems to be one of the major neighborhoods is having a problem, so hopefully that will provide some relief if we provide that opportunity there in Zion Grove. So uh, whatever we need to do to make that happen, just, just let me know. Let's but it may be it. helpful to let the public know if there is somebody else that wants to do that, who would they need to contact and how would they go about doing it. Okay. Who, who, any person, corporation that can sell licenses per the ordinance. So if whoever wants to uh, sign up to sell licenses, get in contact with pet data and pet data will provide all the necessary paperwork to them okay. and run them through how to uh, sell licenses okay. right. Deletta, um I understand there was a um, nice save from one of our animal control officers yesterday you want to give us a quick quick brief update on that you know I'll, uh, if I may I will have Patrick uh, it is uh, his uh, Eddings. Yeah, Jerron Eddings, one of his employees, and he had a conversation with him, so he can give you a blow by blow. So, if I may, I'll uh, divert to Patrick and have him tell you that. Yeah, he was he was actually on his way to uh, to a call, and from what he was telling me, he uh, he saw he observed the house on fire. He pulled up, got out of his truck, 
and uh, he saw a gentleman standing in the front yard. And by the time he went to get his radio, the gentleman disappeared. So he went back looking for the gentleman. Went inside the house. He was inside the house. So he had to pull him out mm-hmm. of the house. Actually, the house, the mattress was on fire inside. Mm-hmm. So he pulled him out. The man wanted to go back and say his wife was inside the house, not knowing the wife was across the street. Mm-hmm. So he said he crawled back in there. Uh, he could only go so far because of the smoke. He came out. That's where he realized the wife was Wow. outside. Mm-hmm. And the gentleman was saying, my three cats are inside the house. So he said he wasn't going to go back in, in the house for the cats. So that's how oh. it pretty much happened. Mm-hmm. That's my neighbor. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> wow. Ironic. Wow. Yeah. So pretty- the cats a little bit of cross-training going on there. <laughs> they lost one cat. Absolutely. They lost one cat. They lost one. Well, Incredible. it's the passion of our city employees, and it's greatly appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilman Sharp, you want to wrap it up? Well, uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, we, we just thought this was important news, and particularly uh, about the new TLC program, and, and uh, uh, felt that all the council should know about it uh, because uh, we can kind of be salespersons and spokespersons for it, too. So uh, we did want to share it with the, the full council, and I appreciate uh, uh, this public private uh, partnership we have to. Uh, try to improve animal welfare and public safety here in Kansas City. It's a much different conversation today. Michelle, Patrick, Deletta, thank you very, very much for your commitment to trying to do what works for for us here in Kansas City. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is discussion of ordinance, resolutions, communication on today's docket for floor introduction. Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I want to draw the council's attention to the last item on page 9 in the first reading, order number 130041. This is a project that's been worked on by legal department for um, for about a year, I think, to be honest. And it's basically writing a new Chapter 3 and pulling all the cities. Uh, I'm handing out. Can, Councilman Ford, can you pass this to the left? Councilman Curl, let's take one. Pass to right. Um, consolidating all the city's contracting language into a single new chapter called three. Um, the intent is to pull large chunks of code intact and to also simplify but yet rem- keep the policy implicate policy positions uh, consistent with the existing code. Uh, there's a summary sheet that I've passed out about it um, that describes what's going on. Um, it even the, it will be on the committee's docket next week, but we're not going to take we're not going to work on it next week. So we're going to want everybody have a chance to look at this. It's a pretty long ordinance. Um, again, there's other than what is summarized on this sheet, there is no intended policy changes um, to it. It's just a modernization of the contracting code. Um, a lot of the contracting code is scattered throughout multiple places of the code of ordinances, and this would bring it all into a, a single chapter three. So I want to make sure everybody is aware that that's going on. Anybody have any comments to that? Anyone else for today's docket? Councilman Sharp? Yeah, Councilman Markson. It's okay. Yeah. Councilman Markson? Oh, we have, um, this is on today. Yes. Um, 120024 is authorizing a settlement with our Fraternal Order of Police. And this, this is a big deal. Uh, you know, the Fraternal Order Police um, filed the lawsuit against us because of the it, not wanting to join our or had the questioning whether we had they had the authority to join our our health plan, and we have made some significant concession agreements, and um, it opens the way to uh, better to further our negotiations on pension reform. So it's it's a very that's a big step. It's it's right. Any comment on that one? And one, one more that we have that there was some, uh, seemed like there's media um, questions about it, but uh, we appropriated uh, $900,000 for um, a contract that T and I looked at, um, and it's for modeling software to look at traffic flow all over the downtown. So it, it has something to do with the streetcar, but it also has something to do with whether or not streets should be one way or two ways, what are the implications of traffic decisions that we make. So it's, it's a very, very, um, going to be very, very useful as uh, we make 
important decisions regarding our traffic patterns and can it we will own the software and we can use that to model other traffic issues so, so it's a very good um, okay. technology councilman sharp uh, thank you madam mayor pro tem uh, uh, as we all know we have the uh, health levy uh, uh, submission uh, on the docket today and uh, we uh, have focused a lot of attention on the uh, uh, uncompensated care that are provided by the various safety net providers through the city like Truman Medical Center, uh, Swope Health Services, Samuel Rogers, and, and others. But as I think we all know, uh, uh, our ambulance service uh, also provides a, a great deal of that amount of care. And we had some data that was presented, as, as you may recall, uh, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, at the Finance Committee. But I have gotten some additional data from the Fire Department that I thought I'd pass out because it covers really uh, uh, the entire time since the fire department has operated the ambulance service and it shows the the huge amount uh, of uncompensated care to medically indigent people that our ambulance service uh, does provide uh, this covers the period from uh, fiscal year 2010 11 fiscal year 2011 12 and then uh, through October 31st uh, of this fiscal year. And uh, we highlighted uh, the, the key uh, points on that. But the great bulk of uh, unreimbursed medical care are, is provided to people who don't have health insurance, and, and they're listed under self-pay. And uh, oftentimes that equates to no pay. And then people who only have Medicaid coverage. Uh, but you'll note, for instance, on, on fiscal year 2010-11, uh, the total charges for people without health insurance was almost $12 million. And yet the uh, collections were only about $300,000. Um, so uh, the percent paid was only about 3%. And on Medicaid, uh, the amount charged was over $12.5 million, but Medicaid itself only paid a little less than $2 million. So again, the percent paid uh, 16%. When you add those two together, uh, you can see that there were over $20 million in, in write-offs, uh, basically uncompensated care. Now, eventually, some of that money is collected because... Uh, uh, those accounts will be turned over to collection agencies, and sometimes even years later you get some payments. But still, uh, you're looking at a percentage paid of only 9% for fiscal year 11-12. Uh, very similar figures. Uh, again, overall collection rate, uh, 9%. And um, so far this year, it, it's, uh, it's even less. But... Uh, even people who have Medicaid coverage, Medicaid pays so low uh, in Missouri for ambulance service that, it, that it's not much higher uh, in, in terms of dollars than, than you collect from people that have no health insurance at all. So uh, I thought that was something the council should be aware of since we've got this data for, for a multi-year period and didn't want to share it. Thank you very much. Councilman Ford. Question for Councilman Sharp. How, do, how does the 3% compare to the, to the old mass days? Is it about the same percentage? Well, as you know, Councilman, as former mass board member, we, we've seen increases in people without having health insurance uh, clear back to, to when you and I were, were there at mass, and, and it's continued. We've had more and more employers drop uh, employee uh, health insurance coverage, so people, uh, people working... Uh, even though they may be working regularly, they may want to have it, but it's not available through their jobs. Uh, I think it is worse now. We, we had uh, higher collections then, um, generally, but, but not a lot higher. And, and self-pay has always been uh, very tough to collect because you figure if they have an ambulance bill, they, they probably got a pretty high hospital emergency room bill and, and bills from all the specialists there. So they may be facing an $800 ambulance bill, but uh, an $8,000 or more uh, emergency room bill. And, and uh, as you know, and I think many of us know, medical care is, is the greatest single reason for personal bankruptcies in America today. 
more than anything else because people who don't have medical insurance, if, if you go into a hospital ER, oftentimes, uh, even if you're not hospitalized, you're looking at a five-figure bill. The, the reason I ask that is even in the old mass days, uh, we sometimes had to get on the executive director to make sure the ambulance crews were being very aggressive in trying to get the information from the patients. Right. Uh, so that's that could be part of the problem. Are we, we doing everything we can to find out if, in fact, someone has insurance, if it's an auto accident, uh, if there's med pay, that type of thing? Um, Th that is always a challenge, but uh, I, Mark O'Dell, uh, who went over to the fire department from the city, uh, is in charge of that now. I know they're instituting a new software program out there that they hope will help with that billing. Uh, as you know now, they have, uh, uh, they, they don't use old paper forms anymore, yeah. but, but get gather that data electronically in yeah, the Yeah, when field. I was on the board, we had gone to the, the tablets in each um, ambulance, and a lot of that was feeding directly to the emergency right. room, so there was a lot of and we couldn't say it was shared information, but patient information from the, from a continuing of caregivers. So I, I think they are uh, doing uh, a, a good job on that. I, I think always you could you want to seek improvements, and I think the new software uh, program they're putting in hopefully will will lead to that. But it, it's sometimes difficult, especially in emergency situations, to get that data uh, at, at the time of the emergency. And a lot of that goes back to patient um, um, education, is especially um, if you're a chronic ill person or elderly person, is to have that prepared somewhere and, and, and ready. Um, and that's part of an education program, too, that, that we could probably start having a conversation about. I, I think, though, we just pointed out that when you were on the board, it was all paper, and then when I was on the board, it was electronic. Yeah. Yeah. Times have changed. <laughs> Well, we switched over to electronic when I was out there, and it was not without hiccups, but uh, it was certainly something we had to do, just as most, uh, you know, you're seeing hospitals now and doctor's offices doing that, and, and eventually it will all be that way. Councilman Davis, I see your hand up. I was hoping that Councilman Sharp could comment on the last three numbers on page one. Uh, it seemed to be all over the place, 46% from hospitals, 51 from private industry, 21 from government. Why the disparity, and what should those percents be? In uh, your self-pay is always going to be very low because of the things we've talked one. about. But uh, Medicaid in Missouri um, provides very, very low uh, reimbursement levels. And I've got those figures. In fact, I meant to bring them to business session, but uh, I have them in my office, and, and I can talk about them in legislative session, but basically on, on your non-emergency transports, Medicaid only pays a little over a hundred bucks. The, the Medicaid uh, payments uh, really are not adequate to, to pay for the cost of service. So uh, I know some people are thinking, well, if we can just expand Medicaid coverage in Missouri, and, and hopefully the General Assembly will do that. It just makes sense since the federal government picks up a hundred percent of the cost for three years and 90 percent of the cost after that and the additional employment alone in our health care industry would probably bring in more state taxes the way more state taxes than that 10 percent would be but even if even if Missouri Medicaid is expanded as to me is a no-brainer unless you expand the reimbursement rates and nobody's even talking about that it still doesn't cover anywhere near the cost of providing the ambulance service because uh, ambulance reimbursement rates under Missouri Medicaid are among the lowest in the nation. My question, John, concerning the last three lines, hospitals, 46 okay. percent, private industry, 51 percent, government, 21 percent. Is that what we would expect? I wonder why they're all over the place. Well, look, look at the percent of billings in your first column. Uh, uh, councilman, th those are those are relatively small amounts, so you see more fluctuations because uh, you, you don't get that many to bill to hospitals or private industry itself, and hardly any to government. Uh, so your your base is, is such a small number that they're going to fluctuate. 
the, 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 the real money comes in from commercial insurance, Medicare. Well, the four categories of billings, the big ones, are commercial insurance, Medicare, self-pay, and Medicaid. And two of those pay pretty good, Medicare and commercial insurance. Medicaid pays pretty crummy, and self-pay hardly pays at all. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, items to be placed on future business session agenda. None today. And a no closed session. All right. Oh. One other thing. You missed your chance. Talking about today's agenda, since you. Uh, we'll go back to th that. There seems to be some confusion in the community as to how we number uh, issues we put on the, uh, uh, the election in April, for example. I know. How we number them? Yeah, in other words, when which is first number one, which is number two, which yeah, is number three. three. Oh. My understanding is the election board does that after consultation with the clerk's office. The clerk's office is usually advised by the mayor and manager as to the order we like to see those. And, and maybe if Bill or the clerk could comment on that, because I, I think there's going to be a group of citizens up on on uh, 26 that would like to see their uh, ballot issue be number one. The mayor's office determines that, and that has been my experience since I started working here. And is that communicated through the clerk to the election board? Yes. Or? Yes. Okay. Councilman Johnson. That is by tradition, correct? Yes. Okay. All righty. Thank you. All right. Well, there doesn't seem to be any other business. We are adjourned. <laughs>